Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Trey Johnson, and welcome to Museum After Hours. Tonight, we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Leo E. Oliva. Dr. Oliva is a historian and author of many books focusing on frontier military history, as well as countless articles for scholarly journals and a weekly newspaper column. Oliva is a founding member of the Santa Fe Trail Association, the Smoky Hill Trail Association, Society of Friends of Historic Fort Hayes, and the Fort Larned Old Guard. He has served on the Humanities Kansas Speakers Bureau and the board of our very own Kansas Historical Society. To honor veterans both past and present, this evening, Dr. Oliva will tell the fascinating tale of the female Buffalo soldier, Cathay Williams. Born into slavery in the 1840s, she went on to become the first enlisted female soldier in the U.S. Army. By switching her name around in 1866, she enlisted and served as Private William Cathay in the Black Regiment of Company A, 38th U.S. Infantry. Although her years in the military were short, she became well-known during post-Civil War America as the first female Buffalo soldier. After the presentation, we will have a question and answer session, so please use the chat and Q&A feature to type in your questions, and we'll get to as many as we can. So let's give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Leo E. Oliva. Thank you very much. Well, the story of uh, Cathay Williams, uh, African-American woman who served in the United States Infantry after the Civil War, is uh, uh, fairly widely known and certainly widely published today. And she enlisted in the military at St. Louis in 1866, and then marched from Fort Leavenworth over the Santa Fe Trail across Kansas to Fort Union in New Mexico. And then from there later marched to uh, Fort Cummings and then to Fort Bayard in New Mexico. And she's often referred to as the female Buffalo soldier. Uh, that was a term that was applied to black troops after her time of service. But she is, you know, she's classified by many people as as a Buffalo soldier because of that. Her name has been spelled many different ways. Uh, I use C-A-T-H-E-Y because that's in the military records. But there's it's often spelled with an A-Y at the end or just a Y. And she was illiterate, signed her name with an X. And so uh, people were spelling what they heard, I guess. But she was also known uh in in some of the records as kate so that that that's another term that was used and uh, i want to look first at the traditional story of cathay williams and uh, books a number of books have been written about her there are historical markers that uh, tell her story today there's a statue of her that was dedicated at uh, leavenworth in 2016 there's another statue in the Veterans Park near Fort Walton Beach, Florida, that was dedicated in 2021. She was inducted into the Santa Fe Trail Association Hall of Fame in 2016. I have presented programs about her. Several reenactors that I know portray her telling her story in first person. And President Joe Biden paid tribute to her in a speech at the Pentagon in February of 2021. So today, I would guess she's probably the best known African-American woman in the American West in the years immediately following the Civil War. Interestingly, this story is based on one newspaper article by a reporter who interviewed Williams in Trinidad, Colorado in 1875. And without this uh, story, we, we would never have heard of, of Kathy Williams uh, Cathay Williams as a uh, Buffalo soldier. The newspaper is the, uh, the uh, St. Louis Daily Times, uh, January 2nd of 1876. And I'm going to read this article. Uh, portions of it have been published uh, uh, many times, but uh, I, I, I want to read the entire article because I think this is the basis for the, for the entire story. And uh, if uh, if if we don't do this, I, I think it'll we'll be missing something. So uh, the uh, when I do the this story and I, I read through it, I'm going to share with you there there are no known images of Cathay Williams, uh, although there are a couple of photographs that claim to be her. 
but a number of artists have tried to uh, uh, create what they think she may have looked like uh, in the military. And I'm, I'm going to share a number of those as uh, as we proceed through the uh, through the uh, program. So the, the, the St. Louis Daily Times, January 2nd, starts off with a headline, She Fought Bravely. And the subheading says, the story of a colored heroine who served as a regularly enlisted soldier during the late war. Footnote here, the late war would refer to the Civil War, and technically she did not enlist until after the Civil War. The article continues, the byline is a special correspondence of the, of the St. Louis Times. The reporter is never identified, just refers to himself as, as, the, as the Times representative. And here's the introduction in, in the newspaper. Trinidad, Colorado, December 24th. A character in Trinidad is a colored woman by the name of Cathay Williams, or as she is called by the residents, Kate. The Times representative, having heard that the woman had served in the late war and was in other respects an in, in, interesting individual, recently called at her, I recently called at her humble abode for the purpose of learning something of her history. She resides alone in adobe building of one room in the northern portion of the town. She received the Times man very politely, though with an assumed uh, formality that had a slight touch of the ridiculous. Like her Mexican neighbors, she had no chairs. But knowing that Americans preferred sitting to squatting on the floor, she requested her visitor to be seated on a box which occupied, occupied a corner of the room. The room was scantily furnished, but everything visible was neat and tidy. Kate is tall and powerfully built, black as night, masculine looking, and has a very independent air both in conversation and action. Dressed in male attire, she would readily pass for a man. Her face is marked with smallpox. She appears hard and sinewy as if her life has been one of exposure. She's 30 or 35 years of age. The object of the visit being made known, she, with some hesitation, gave the following account of herself. More images. So this is Kathy Williams' story from the newspaper, quoting her. My father was a free man, but my mother was a slave, belonging to William Johnson, a wealthy farmer who lived at the time I was born near Independence, Jackson County, Missouri. While I was a small girl, my master and family moved to Jefferson City. My master died there, and when the war broke out and the United States soldiers came to Jefferson City, they took me and other colored folks with them to Little Rock. Colonel Benton of the 13th Army Corps was the officer that carried us off. Footnote again, uh, Colonel uh, Benton, uh, was the William Benton commanded the 8th Indiana Infantry. And so she was attached to a company of the 8th Indiana Infantry. She continues, I didn't want to go. He wanted me to cook for the officers, but I'd always been a house girl and didn't know how to cook. I learned cook how to cook after going to Little Rock and was with the army at the Battle of Pea Ridge, Arkansas. That battle, by the way, was March 7th and 8th of 1862. Afterward, the command moved over various portions of Arkansas and Louisiana. I saw the soldiers burn lots of cotton and was at Shreveport when the rebel gunboats were captured and burned on Red River. We afterwards went to New Orleans, then by way of the Gulf to Savannah, Georgia, then to Macon and other places in the South. And finally, I was sent to Washington City. And at the time, General Sheridan made his raids in the Shenandoah Valley. I was cook and washerwoman for his staff. I was sent from Virginia to some place in Iowa and afterward to Jefferson Barracks, which is near St. Louis, where I remained some time. And you'll see by this paper that by the fifth, on the 15th day of November, 1866, I enlisted in the United States Army in St. Louis in the 38th United States Infantry Company A, Captain Charles E. Clark commanding. And what she's handed him is her discharge paper. <clears throat> I enlisted to serve three years. Then the Times man examined the paper, found it to be genuine, and a discharge from the Army dated at Fort Baird in New Mexico, October 14th of 1868. The discharge was granted on a surgeon's certificate and stated that the character of the discharge was good. Continuing, the woman said, the regiment I joined wore the Zouave uniform and only two persons, a cousin and a particular friend, 
members of the regiment knew that I was a woman. They never blowed on me. They were partly the cause of my joining the army. Another reason was that I wanted to make my own living and not be dependent on relations uh, or friends. And soon after I joined the army, I was taken with the smallpox and was sick in a hospital across the river from St. Louis. But as soon as I got well, I joined my company in New Mexico. I was a good soldier, as that paper says. I was never put in the guardhouse. No bayonet was ever put to my back. I carried my musket and did guard and other duties while in the army. But finally, I got tired and wanted to get off. And I played sick, complained of pains in my side and rheumatism in my knees. The post-surgeon found out I was a woman and I got my discharge. The men all wanted to get rid of me when they found out I was a woman. Some of them acted real bad to me. After leaving the army, I went to Pueblo, Colorado, where I made money by cooking and washing. I got married while there, but my husband was no account. He stole my watch and chain, $100 in money, and my team of horses and wagon. I had him arrested and put in jail. And then I came here, meaning to Trinidad, Colorado. I like this town. I know all the good people here, and I expect to get rich yet. I haven't got my land warrant. I thought I'd wait until the railroad came through and then take my land near the depot. Grant owns all this land around here, and it won't cost me anything. I shall never live in the States again. You see, I've got a good sewing machine, and I got washing to do and clothes to make. I want to get along and not be a burden to my friends or relatives. And the reporter continues in dealing, detailing the above. The woman sometimes failed to recall dates and names of places, but otherwise her narrative was uh, smooth and well-connected. The Times representative returned his thanks for the information and retired uh, with the promise to give a truthful account of what he had been told. And so with this article, the story of Cathay Williams, uh, without it, would, her story wouldn't be known. Uh, several biographers have expanded on her story using military records. Uh, and there's a, a reference in the 1880 census, she appears there. And there's a few m newspaper mentions along the way. Uh, so a, a quick look with, at her story, of course, uh, tells her story that born in independence, uh, uh, her mother was a slave. Uh, she, she was a slave. She was taken by Union troops uh, during the Civil War in 1861, when they came to the plantation near Jefferson City in Missouri. And slaves at that time were considered contraband by the uh, United States government. Uh, contraband was any property that was owned by the people in the rebel states, uh, the Confederate states, could be taken and used by the army. And since slaves were property, they were taken and considered as contraband. They weren't really free until after the war, but they uh, they were uh, employees of of the army and pr primarily as cooks and laundresses, uh, some of them nurses. Uh, so she she spent that time with the Eighth Indiana uh, Volunteer Infantry as a cook, and she was in a number of states as she mentioned, and finally ended up uh, in Virginia and uh, late in the war, and was assigned to General Sheridan's command in Virginia. Uh, this is a photo uh, that is reported by some biographers to be uh, Kathy Williams. Uh, it, it is a low resolution photo. And when I blew it up to, uh, to try to, to show more of the, the, uh, the servant, uh, person serving uh, General Sheridan here, it, it gets a little grainy. But this is a photo that appears in a number of the biographies and the people claim that this is uh, this this is her. But there's a problem with this photo because the photo is dated and identified where it was taken. And it was taken in, in uh, uh, at Brandy Station Battle, Culpeper, Virginia in June of 1863. But the 8th Indiana Infantry didn't join Sheridan in the Shenandoah Valley until August of 1864. Uh, it's possible that she was assigned to his staff prior to that, but it also raises a question, uh, was she uh, there uh, a year earlier for this photo? And the photo appears to be a male, uh, and uh, many people have 
I've mentioned that as well. Uh, then she claimed that she was at uh, uh, Jefferson Barracks near St. Louis when the war ended. And uh, that, that was a military post. Uh, and she observed how the military had operated while she had been with the Union Army. And she decided that it would be easier for her to become a soldier than she knew the routine. So when Congress authorized the creation of four black regiments of infantry, the 38th, 39th, 40th, and 41st, and later they were reduced to two and became the numbers 24 and 25th infantry. And there were two companies of cavalry, the 9th and 10th U.S. cavalry that lasted well into the 20th century. They were created in 1866, uh, segregated uh, troops, but to provide uh, openings for uh, African-Americans to serve in the United States Army uh, because many of them had served during the Civil War. She later said that she wanted financial independence and she saw the Army as a way to survive and make a living. And reportedly, as noted, she appeared, uh, she looked masculine, had a muscular frame, and could easily pass as a man. So she, she put on men's clothing, cut her hair, as, she, as the biographers say, and enlisted in the infantry. And uh, this, is a, this is a copy from the National Archives. These, these are also online today that you can access, but these are records from the National Archives. This is the enlistment uh, paper of William Cathay, and uh, it, uh, it gives the basic information, and uh, it... it uh, is, is, of course, a, a document that proves that William Cathay was enlisted in the army. Uh, but the only document that identifies uh, William Cathay as a woman is that newspaper article I quoted at the beginning. There's no mention in the military records at any place that William Cathay was ever identified as female. And she was given a medical discharge in 1868 because her health conditions became so serious uh, whether they were pretended or real, that she was unable to report for duty and she was uh, given a medical discharge. Soon after she enlisted, she contracted smallpox, as mentioned in, in her newspaper article, and she spent time in a hospital across the river from St. Louis and uh, it left her in a weakened condition. And the rest of her Company A of the 38th Infantry was transported by steamboat to Fort Leavenworth in February of 1867. And they started marching over the Santa Fe Trail later in the spring. And Private Cathay followed later and uh, she joined the regiment on the trail at Fort Riley where they had uh, got at that point. And so this is a picture of Fort Riley taken just the year before she was there. And she spent some time in the post hospital at Fort Riley with what is described in the post surgeon's records there as the itch. And she was with the regiment at Fort Harker before they continued on the march to New Mexico. At some point, uh, the soldiers of Company A of the 38th U.S. Infantry contracted, uh, were infected by Asiatic cholera. Some people speculate that may have happened before they even left St. Louis. Others said it may have happened at, at uh, Fort Leavenworth or maybe Fort Riley. But we do know that they spread this disease at, to military posts along the trail as they traveled, the wagon trains that were traveling the trail. And from those people, it spread to the Plains Indians who suffered great losses and to the other trails, such as the Oregon, California Trail, Smoky Hill Trail. It was a widespread epidemic on the Plains in 1867. And their company is blamed for spreading it, although, uh, of course, they, they had no responsibility for it, other than the fact that they were forced to march uh, while carrying that disease to New Mexico. They arrived at Fort Union, New Mexico in July of 1867, and they brought the cholera with them there. Private Cathay was part of the Fort Union garrison uh, for a couple of months, and then they were marched to Fort Cummings in southwest New Mexico, Fort Cummings, uh, 1863 to 1886. And uh, this is about 20 miles northeast of Deming, New Mexico. And there, Private Cathay was often ill. 
and she claims she managed to conceal her true identity, which must have been very difficult when she was in military hospitals. It's not clear what her medical problems were, but she may have been weakened by the smallpox that she had before she left St. Louis, the long walk to New Mexico, because they did walk uh, that whole distance, probably had uh, been another factor uh, in her uh, health condition. And the post con uh, the post surgeon at Fort Cummings recorded that she suffered from neuralgia, that is a severe pain from damaged or inflamed nerves, and other debilitating pains. Uh, she may have been diabetic too, a disease that reportedly uh, affected her later in life. And neuralgia could be a result of smallpox and or diabetes. So this all, it all ties together. Private Cathay may have become disillusioned with the army, as she mentioned. Garrison life at a frontier military post was quite different from the life of troops in the field during the Civil War. And the African-American troops were assigned, of course, uh, most of, of the uh, detailed uh, jobs at the fort of, of keeping it clean, of, of, of cooking, and so on. Uh, perhaps this also added to her uh, health uh, uh, problems, including her mental health. Whatever the cause, her illness was probably the reason that she decided, as she said, to complain of pains and disability to get out of the Army. And she was marched to uh, Fort Bayard in New Mexico, uh, which is at, at Santa Clara, not far from, from Silver City uh, in, in, the Northwest, in southwestern New Mexico. And her health declined, and she was admitted to the post hospital there. She was unable to report for duty for the last 60 days of her term of service, and she was declared unfit for duty most of that time and uh, was given that medical discharge in October of 1868. This is a copy of her discharge papers. This is the paper that she would have shown, copy of which she would have shown to the newspaper reporter. And it contains, it contains statements written by her commanding officer, uh, Charles uh, uh, Clark, and the post surgeon at Fort Bayard, uh, D.L. Huntington. Clark wrote that Private Cathy, since being under his command, and this is a quote, was then and has been since feeble, both physically and mentally, and much of the time, quite unfit for duty. The origin of these infirmities is unknown to me, end of quote. Surgeon Huntington stated, I certify, and this is a quote, I certify that I examined the said William Cathay, private of, Com of Captain Charles E. Clark's A Company, find him incapable of, of performing the duties of a soldier because of a scrofulous, uh, meaning a diseased or rundown appearance or morally uh, contaminated, and also feeble habits. He is continually on sick report without benefit. He is unable to do military duty and is unfit for any service involving the least exposure. This condition dates prior to enlistment, end quote. That last statement was to be very important later when F.A. Williams applied for a veteran's pension because of medical problems. They would point to say, that her discharge said that her condition predated her enlistment, and that was denied. As a private citizen, Kathy Williams, according to the biographers, let her hair grow, wore women's clothing, and she reportedly worked as a cook for a short time at Fort Union in New Mexico, and then moved to Pueblo, Colorado, where she served as a cook and laundress and seamstress. And Cathay reportedly managed to save her money and achieve some financial independence there. While in Pueblo, she said she had married a man that she called the no account who stole her money, wagon, and horses, and she had him arrested and so on. Uh, there is uh, uh, no record uh, uh, of a marriage that exists, but most of the county records uh, in the, the uh, region uh, just can't find the, the court records and, and other records. And I've been told by someone that some of those records burned in a fire at one time, but I'm still searching for them. This is a photograph that the biographers uh, say uh, may be Kathy Williams. And she was, uh, uh, they say it was when she was uh, working at the Lincoln Orphanage for Negro Children in Pueblo in the 1870s. Other sources have claimed it's her mother, Martha Williams, 
But it seems to me that this photo fits better the descriptions that we have heard of of her appearance. The white spots on her face are this are the sun shining through uh, her hat on her face, which which makes it uh, difficult uh, to see. But uh, there, there's also a, a question about this photo because the Lincoln home in, in Pueblo wasn't established until 1906. But it still could have been a photo that was taken in the 1870s at a different location. The federal census in Trinidad, Colorado, 1880 includes Kate Williams. Uh, it's probably uh, difficult to read on the screen, but she is the third line from the bottom, uh, just above the, the, the heavy dark line, the first uh, dark line from the bottom. And it uh, says William Kate, black, female, age is given as 37. She is listed as married, washerwoman, and cannot read or write. That's those two checks off to, to the right to, about could they read or, or write. And her birthplace is listed as New Mexico. She, her birthplace of her father's New Mexico and her mother New Mexico. And of course, that's much different than her claim earlier that she was uh, born in Missouri. She's also uh, listed as living alone at the time, although uh, she is listed as married. So she, she does appear in the census there is a Kate uh, Williams in the uh, 1870 census in Pueblo who matches all the description except for one thing. The census taker uh, put race as white, but everything else fits and it's possible. The census taker never saw her. She was a servant of, uh, living in a, a house with, a, with a, a Mexican family at that time. And it's possible that the neighbor saw her, but at any rate, she was in the census. Then, uh, she uh, developed uh, serious medical problems in uh, 1890, had surgery to remove some or all of her toes at that point, and that's usually associated with the speculation that she was diabetic. And uh, she fell into poverty, and uh, she reportedly walked with a crutch after she had uh, this uh, surgery. She hired attorneys to... Uh, try to get a pension, medical pension for her. And this claim was filed under the name of Kathy Williams, claiming that she had been served as William Cathay, as her enlistment and discharge paper showed. And according to the claim filed and the rejection of the claim, uh, Cathay Williams did not file the claim for, and this is a quote from their alleged disability to her feet as the pension cause, end of quote. The... Uh, uh, Pension rejection, uh, and this is this is a, a portion of it again uh, difficult to read without really blowing it up. But the claim was filed for deafness, as quoted in the rejection, that she alleges that she contracted smallpox and that while suffering from such disease, she was obliged to swim the Rio Grande River, and the experience and effects of smallpox caused deafness. End of quote. The rejection also noted that the doctor who examined Cathay Williams for the claim had not mentioned disability from deafness. Uh, the attorneys couldn't convince the Pension Bureau to award Cathay, uh, Cathay any belief for her disabilities because her discharge for medical reasons, uh, according to the Pension Bureau, cannot under any circumstances state what disease for which uh, discharge. And then, of course, the statement at the on the discharge that the condition dates uh, prior to the enlistment was the reason that it was tossed out. Her claim was denied. In 1892, she appears to have been indigent and probably was a ward of the county. But again, the county records I have not been able to locate. The early county records, uh, uh, I hope, will show up at some point. But we need we need some documentation. But the biographers speculate that she probably died in late 1892 or uh, early uh, 1893 and was buried at an unmarked grave in Trinidad, Colorado. And then there's this thing that shows up. This is on Find a Grave online, and it claims that Private Kathy Williams uh, died at Raton, New Mexico in 1924. And uh, that she buried in an unmarked grave in Fairmont Cemetery. 
uh, this is a hoax. If somebody did this, there, there were rumors that in some of the biographies that, that Kathy Williams may have lived for a time in Raton, uh, not, not too far, of course, from uh, Trinidad. But someone has posted this online. And of course, with an unmarked grave, there's, there's no way uh, to find it. But that has shown up as well. There are a number of books written about uh, of Cathay Williams. The first main uh, book that covers the, the, the full story is uh, uh, Philip Thomas Tucker's book, Cathay Williams from Slave to Female Buffalo Soldier. Uh, first published in 2002, has been revised since. And, uh, and uh, Tucker has written some other books uh, about Cathay Williams too, at least a, a total of four. The one that's shown on the right here is actually a children's book that he published in 2019. There are a couple of books uh, here, Kathy Williams, Buffalo Soldier, published 2021. And then the other one here, She Was a Buffalo Soldier, book one, which implies there's going to be a book two, I assume, uh, was also published in uh, recently in 2018. And then the, 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 uh, the Meet Kathy Williams, is another 2021 publication, and the one on the right by Grady Young is the history of, of Kathy Williams, or Kathy Williams as he spells it, and uh, and uh, it's also 2021. 2021, remember, is the is the time that the marker was placed and the statue placed in the Veterans Park in Florida, and so these may be associated. But as near as I can tell, almost all of these books use the same material that Tucker uses in the in the first biography. Uh, here, here's here's a couple more. Um, and these are these are both published in 2021. There is one novel called The Daughter of the Daughter of the Queen by Sarah Bird, published in uh, 2018. And the argument, the, the story is that Cathay Williams was the daughter of a slave uh, whose mother, her mother, her, be her grandmother, was a, a, a queen in Africa before she was captured and brought as a slave to the United States. So uh, that, that's a that's a novel. This is the marker in memory of, of Cathay Williams in Trinidad, Colorado. And uh, I have seen this marker. I'm not sure if it's still up or not, uh, but because some of the markers have, have been taken down. But uh, at any rate, uh, this this marker, and, and I don't know if you can uh, read it, uh, there uh, or, or not, but uh, uh, very quickly at the time, it reads that when the, at the time when the military banned women, former slave Cathay Williams disguised herself as a man and enlisted in the all black 38th U.S. Infantry in 1866. She served honorably as a private William Cathay for nearly two years and ready to give up army life. She allowed a doctor to discover her secret. She lived in Trinidad during her final years. Williams was the first known African-American woman to enlist in the U.S. Army, and the only known female Buffalo soldier, her service represents the contributions of all African-American women who helped settle the West. And then it tells who placed that marker there. This is the text uh, from a marker that was uh, placed uh, near Fort Bayard, in uh, the site of Fort Bayard in New Mexico. And I think I think you can, you can uh, read through that. Uh, that sign, uh, as far as I know, uh, has deteriorated and has been taken down. And the Preservation Society for the site of, of, of Old Fort Baird are considering uh, a new sign to put up there. But again, it, it's the, it's a very uh, quick summary of the basic story of the female Buffalo soldier. There is also this uh, exhibit at the U.S. Army Women's Museum in Fort Lee, Virginia. And uh, again, it's just a panel uh, with a photo and uh, a short summary of the... Uh, service of Cathay uh, Williams, that's uh, typical. This is the dedication of the statue at the Richard Allen Cultural Center and Museum in Leavenworth, Kansas on July 22nd of 18, or 2016. And uh, the, the, the close up there uh, gives a little better view of the uh, place. I might just mention that the, this is, there are only two women who traveled the Santa Fe Trail for whom there are statues today. And the other is uh, Susan Shelby McGoffin, uh, who's famous for her diary that's been in print since 1926. 
and her statue was dedicated in 2012 in El Paso, Texas, where the McGoffin family had uh, a portion of the family had settled. Uh, this is the statue that's displayed at the, at the Richard Allen uh, Cultural Center and Museum in Leavenworth. This is a sign that's erected at the Veterans Park near Fort Walton Beach, Florida in 2021. Again, the summary is the same information that we've gone over. And this is the statue that uh, of Cathay Williams that's erected there beside that marker in, in the Veterans Park in, in, in Florida. And Kathy Williams was inducted into the Santa Fe Trail Association Hall of Fame in, in 2016. The Hall of Fame is uh, to recognize uh, well-known people who traveled uh, the historic Santa Fe Trail, and she was included for that. So that's the traditional story of Kathy Williams, 1844 to quote, uh, 1893 question mark. Uh, but uh, the traditional story as I said, repeated many times, uh, published, and uh, so on. But there's always been a problem with that story for me, and it bothered me. And we know that Kathy Williams was hospitalized numerous times in at least four uh, military hospitals, and sometimes for a fairly long period of time. And it's difficult for me to understand how it was never discovered that she was a woman disguised as a man. But not once is there mentioned in the military records that Cathay was female. But now, the rest of the story, this is uh, information that has come to light within recent, very recent uh, years. And Cathay Williams didn't die in 1892 or 1893, but her life took a major twist, and that's the rest of the story. And note that there's also uh, the name change here. Uh, it's no longer Cathay Williams, it's William Cathay. And it's also spelled in some of the records, uh, including census record as, as C-A-T-H-E-R, which uh, could have just been the way that they heard the pronunciation of the name. But again, we need to go to a newspaper article. And uh, this is from the Rocky Mountain News in Denver, Colorado, 22nd of April, 1897. And uh, I'm going to quote this article because it tells us the rest of the story. It was published on the, on the 22nd of April, but the story is actually written in Pueblo, uh, Colorado, and uh, it's dated Pueblo, Colorado, April 21st, the day before. And it starts off with a headline, William Cathay's whim, for 20 years, he masqueraded as a woman. And then it starts, with the article, 15 or 20 years ago, uh, they, they just spell it Kathy, C-A-T-H-Y. Uh, Kathy Williams was a well-known and highly respected Negro servant woman in Pueblo. She was employed by many of the most prominent families as a laundress, thoroughly differential in every way. <clears throat> uh, she was a typical servant of the South during the antebellum days. Some years ago, she left Pueblo and went to Trinidad, where she worked for many of the prominent people, especially in the capacity of a, of a laundress. Some months ago, Kathy Williams gave evidence of insanity and was adjudged insane by the county court of Trinidad. Again, where are the records? There being no room in the woman's department at the insane asylum here, meaning in Pueblo, she was brought to a private asylum then maintained at the Mount Pleasant House on Tenderfoot Hill. Footnote here, there are records documenting this that William Cathay was admitted to the Woodcroft Hospital in Pueblo from Trinidad on September 26th of 1896. Continuing the newspaper article quoting, no place for her. Arriving there, the supposed woman immediately told the attending physician that it was no place for her as she was a man. The fact discovered it was deemed best, however, not to make a change in the patient's style of dress, which had been worn for 20 years on account of its possible effect on the disease from which the patient was suffering. Arrangements were made to keep the patient and she was put in charge of the laundry. Antithopy to women. As in previous years, Kathy Williams displayed great antithopy to women and had nothing to do with them except to give instructions in his department. 
Sometime last week, it was decided that owing to the lack of room at the private asylum, it was necessary to send the patient back to Trinidad. And accordingly, last week, Kathy Williams left here. On Monday, the same individual appeared in the county court in Trinidad as William Cathay and was adjudged insane and returned here today and committed to the, well, the, the asylum as a man. This would be to the Pueblo County Insane Asylum. Picture of it here. The article continues, Cathay's malady. The malady from which Cathay is suffering is a belief that an Italian with a bear is constantly following him and calling to him to dance with the bear for the amusement of the public. Except for this one thing, Cathay is entirely rational. He says he served through the war as a body servant to General Sherman and Grant, and he donned women's clothing in a moment of whim and continued to wear them. Cathay Williams is well remembered by a large number of people here, and the fact that she was a man will be a great surprise to many here and in Trinidad, where uh, Williams was one of the most respected servants in the city. He is about 50 years of age, medium size, fairly stout. This uh, story was repeated in, uh, you know, copied and repeated a uh, shorter version in some of the other newspapers in Colorado, but the, the main source is, is the Rocky Mountain News. Uh, then there is uh, a, a census records in 1900 and 1910, federal census, and this is where the spelling is C-A-T-H-E-R, but it's, it's William, uh, again, patient at Pueblo County Insane Asylum, race black, gender male, born Ohio now, uh, estimated birth 1842, their birth dates all over from early 1840s to 1850. So probably, you know, any time in the, in the decade of the 1840s uh, is close. Uh, age 58, marital sta status, single. And it's the same for the, for the 1910 federal census, uh, the same information with the, the birth in, in Ohio. The uh, Pueblo Insane Asylum, according to the reports of a state investigation uh, of the conditions there in 1898 were literally deplorable. The annual report for the asylum in 1897 shows that there were an average, the average daily number of patients at the institution for that year was 427, of whom 300 were men. Uh, the 1898 report declared that the institution was more of a prison than a hospital that helped patients. People with mental problems were often considered to be criminals in that time period. Transgender identity was considered to be criminal and mental illness as well. And those had to figure in, I think, to the, to the assignment of, uh, of William Cathay to the asylum. The care was declared inadequate. The food was just listed as terrible. The patient's needs were neglected, and the patients were often locked in their rooms, could not could not get out. I mean, it, it literally was like a prison. And so I think by by the many reports that are available in newspaper records and the reports of of the of the Colorado investigations that are available, the final years for, for William Cathay in this institution had to be a living hell. Uh, William Cathay died at the Pueblo County Insane Asylum uh, on 27 September of 1911. He was buried in an unmarked grave in the asylum cemetery, but the plot number was recorded. So that information is available. The female Buffalo soldier actually served as a man, became a transgender woman or trans woman after military service, and that's a remarkable story too, and it deserves to be told. Because she is identified as, she identified as female gender, I respectfully continue to use the pronoun she. She faced many obstacles in life. Born a slave, suffered the consequences of prejudices and discrimination associated with that inhumane status. Her life as a contraband servant for the Union troops in the Civil War was not much different than slavery. She was not in control of her own life until after the war. As a free black person after the Civil War, she faced racial discrimination, an obstacle to economic survival. 
but she saw military service as with which she was familiar as a way to survive and earn a living. So one may speculate, as others have done too, that her particular friend that helped uh, her uh, enlist in the military uh, may well have been her lover, as the uh, some biographers have speculated. It's difficult to determine from the records what destroyed her health, but it seems very possible that the smallpox and possible uh, diabetes, the amputation of toes, uh, certainly had a, a, an effect upon her health. And she probably had difficulty finding a job after uh, after uh, she was out of the military. Uh, she did, of course, uh, had been a worship woman. Uh, she apparently was an accomplished seamstress as well. So with those skills, she was able to earn her living. Uh, one of the questions that a friend of mine asked, would it have been easier for her to find a job uh, as a laundress for you know the well-to-do families in Pueblo and in Trinidad, would it be easier for her to find that job as a woman than it would be as a man? Which is, which is a question I think to consider. She became a transgender woman, was able to live that way for nearly three decades. And uh, if she was actually married, and there's no record as I, as I, as I say, during that period of time, uh, technically, it would have been a same-sex marriage in Colorado in the early 1870s, and it could have been a common law marriage, which was not uncommon at that period of time. When the health problems uh, led to the amputation of toes and uh, her uh, request for a pension was blocked by the military surgeon's statement that her condition predated her enlistment, she literally had no hope at that point. And so when it's discovered that she was a trans woman, in addition to being ill, indigent, and black, the judgment of insanity for which she was locked up rather than really helped was a final form of discrimination against this person. The conditions under which she lived her final years uh, were truly deplorable. Uh, she deserves to re be remembered and commemorated for what she did. And I think she deserves to be treated as part of the nation's LGBTQA plus social and cultural history. Her story is a sad commentary on our history of prejudice and discrimination. Her traditional story is admirable and tells us a lot about her. The rest of the story I think is sad and tells us more about our history than about a uh, private William Cafe. So the true, the true story needs to be told of, 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 of what I have described. And I, also I think we should not uh, condemn the biographers who have written about her because of that newspaper article that, that she uh, uh, dictated in 1876. Uh, uh, and then the military records for William Cathay uh, would lead one to believe that that was, the, that was the true story. But now that we know the rest of the story, uh, I hope those biographers will uh, continue to, uh, to write and, and write about the rest of the story and correct a story. And if anyone's interested in, in looking at the records that are now available online from the Pueblo County Insane Asylum, uh, all of the patients for the many years that that asylum was open are uh, available online. And if you get to the site, you just have to scroll through. They're in alphabetical order. So when you get to, to Cathay uh, uh, William, uh, you, you will find, and you can click on that and see the records that are there. Either one of these uh, will take you to that site. But with that information, I would, I would like to open it up to questions and uh, uh, see, see if there are any comments. So uh, thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Oliva. This, I, I will be honest, this was a roller coaster of a presentation. Um, <laughs> yes. I I have to ask, when when did this, uh, this new information come to light? Because, uh, I mean, everything I've seen online, I don't think I've I've seen a mention of this. Uh, a friend of mine who has written about uh, black troops uh, and uh, uh, John Langelier, and he has a new book coming out, by the way, uh, within within the next month, I think, that uh, he also is including this story. I'm preparing for the, this for publication. There is a woman in uh, Pueblo, Colorado, 
who wrote a little article about this new information for the local newspaper there. And so for a couple of years, this has been, you know, going around. And I have visited, I, I know some of the uh, Buffalo Soldier reenactors who always tell the story of, 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 of Cathay Williams. And uh, uh, most of them, they don't want to believe that the, the new information, they want to stick with the old story. Uh, an African-American friend of mine who's retired in the National Park Service, he, he's very upset about this. He said, it's terrible that they want to believe the myth rather than the truth. And he's going to start working on this uh, as well. And uh, so there, there are a number of us. And uh, I, my friend, John Langelier, he urged me to do these programs to help get the word out. I, like I've done this at Fort Larned and, and, and a couple of other places. And uh, but the, the, my article will, will appear in the Santa Fe Trail Association uh, news or quarterly uh, because she, she she marched over the Santa Fe Trail. She's in the Santa Fe Trail Hall of Fame, so it seems like that's a logical place to to include this story. But yes, it it, it was something that I have always suspected because of the time spent in those military hospitals. How could she avoid detection? Well, obviously she. <laughs> there was nothing to detect at that period of time. But I, I, I just think it's amazing that she managed to live for really uh, almost uh, 30 years uh, as, as a transgender uh, woman in Colorado, and no one suspected it. And I mean, she apparently worked for some of the big name families in those communities as well as a launchers and a seamstress. So uh, I think it's just a fascinating story myself. <laughs> To, oh. to, to get the rest of it. And, well, it, and to me, it's a sad story, too, because of, you know, the, the life that she had, too. But it needs to be told, I think. Yeah, well, uh, Susan uh, made a comment here and uh, took the words right out of my mouth. Uh, what a fascinating story. <laughs> um, uh, you. Yeah, Thank this you. is incredible. And I will be honest, one of the questions that I was going to ask you uh, was, uh, are there any authors that argue that, uh, you know, she, she wasn't, uh, a woman. And then, uh, then about halfway through your presentation, I was like, <laughs> what, you, you already went there for me. <laughs> now it's amazing how many books there are about, uh, you know, the female Buffalo soldier. And the, I mean, that, that's a fascinating topic, but it, it, it seems like, uh, you know, the, the rest of the story needs to be told now. And I'm hoping those biographers uh, will do that. I mean, they have they have a real opportunity here, I think. Yeah. Well, so what got you interested uh, in this uh, topic to begin with? Oh, well, I've been doing military history since 1959. My first publication about the military on the Santa Fe Trail, by the way. And uh, my first book was Soldiers on the Santa Fe Trail, published in 1967. But I've continued to work on this, and I became especially interested in African-American troops after more details came out and books started to be published. And so I, re I ran across the story of, of Kathy Williams, oh, probably, I'm going to say 20-some years ago, about. And uh, so, and then uh, I have met people that portrayed her, you know, first-person uh, first reenactments, uh, and some of them do such a great job. I mean, it, it you believe that they are that person. I mean, they, they do such a great job. And I have presented programs too at conferences, uh, you know, about African-American soldiers. I've included the story of, uh, of Cathay uh, Williams. And so that's that's what got me interested. But I, like I say, my suspicions were always because of all that time in the post hospitals. And I visited with a friend of mine who's a ranger at Fort Larned and he said, the military in, you know, the, the physicals that were given at that period of time and, you know, the, 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 the enlistment paper describes the, by, the, by the surgeon that they uh, examined the, these people. Uh, he said th those examinations would, would have caught a female at that point, at that time. Uh, so th there are women who served in the military. Often they were in volunteer units. There was a woman who served on the Santa Fe Trail during the Mexican War, and uh, she was at Fort Mann, which is just west of where Dodge City is today. And she was there for, uh, well, they were there for about a year 
the, the, her company. It was specially raised to deal with the, you know, Indian resistance on the trail during the war with Mexico. But she gave herself up. She identified herself as a woman because she got tired of the way she was being treated there. Uh, and interestingly enough, they didn't send her back to Fort Leavenworth for several months because they, you know, they were waiting for a wagon train to take her back. And so, and it just so happened there was a soldier returning from New Mexico that was on the same wagon train. And he wrote a description of her on that travel from Fort Mann back to Fort Leavenworth, where she was given an honorable discharge. And later she received a land grant as other soldiers did from the Mexican war. So fascinating. So, but yes, I, I became interested in, in the, you know, women that served in the military along the way. Yeah. Well, and so this is a question that, uh, I get uh, from a lot of students, uh, especially when we're talking about the, the Civil War, is you know how many how many women disguise themselves? Um, do you have any? Is there any estimate at all to to the the potential number of individuals that there there that are exist? estimates, but I you know they vary all over the place, and certainly there were women that have served in in probably every war that we have, we have. We know women in the Revolutionary War. Uh, the, the Mexican War, the, the uh, Civil War. And there are probably a number of them because it was easier for them to serve in volunteer units and think. The Civil War was almost all fought by volunteer units from the states. The federal army was not very large at all. I mean, there were only six regiments of cavalry in the United States when the Civil War broke out and they only added two more during the war. There were only eight regiments of U.S. cavalry <laughs> But all of those cavalry units were from the states. Uh, you know, there was the, the Michigan cavalry and the Indiana cavalry and all the other states. So, and there were women that we know served in those units. So, and uh, Susan asked, uh, were asked a question about the, um, the person that received that land grant. Um, was she white? Yes, yes. Yeah, the, the, these these troops that were in the Indian battalion were all white. From they were all raised in Missouri, uh, and they served for just a little over a year. Uh, when the war was over with Mexico, they were soon mustered out of service. But uh, they they were at Fort Mann for about one year, and were, were very successful in uh, negotiating. In some cases, to with with the, the help of the Indian agent to, to uh, get some of the, uh, well, the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and the Kiowa agreed to move away from the Santa Fe Trail during 1848. They didn't bother anybody on the trail that year. So, I mean, they they were quite successful uh, for, a, for a volunteer unit. And, and everybody said, you know, that none of them had any military training and they weren't given any training. They were just marched out there from Fort Leavenworth. <laughs> it's hard to tell. But, yeah, they... It's fascinating. Well, this is this has been uh, incredible. I'm not expecting. Uh, I not did not expect this twist at all. Um, so <laughs> I didn't want to warn everybody ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So uh, very intriguing. Just a fascinating tale. Um, it is, and uh, I I can't wait to to read uh, what you publish. Uh, so you gotta gotta keep me updated and let me know. Uh, I will. Sure. Um, so we, sure. we will all be looking forward to that. Um, thank you. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> well, thank you again so much for, for taking yeah. time out of your schedule, uh, to do this program, uh, with us. And, uh, I hope everybody here can uh, join us next month on December 13th at the same time, uh, 6 30 to hear Marla Day present Dress for Success, Nellie Dawn and American Fashion. So yeah. from all of us here at Museum After Hours, thanks so much for tuning in 